All right, hello everyone. I'm here, and uh, welcome to the deepest law, uh, your oasis of calm in the middle of a sea of chaos, so to speak. I'm sitting here with a nice uh, cup of coffee today, uh, a mug. Uh, now I've taken a, a brief. Uh, pause on my drinking of Nescafe Gold. Uh, this is the Littles, uh, the Littles Irish, uh, Irish coffee uh, or Irish cream uh, infused coffee. Um, lovely. So um, what of the, uh, so in the middle of uh, this uh, obviously extremely political week, uh, I wanted to get as far away from the hurly-burly of the uh, election as possible and just give you a little window uh, in which to take a break from the chaos of it all and uh, and instead um, focus on uh, some little obscure nook of culture. And I wanted to um, concentrate today on Enid Blyton. Now, for those of you who don't know, for you, if you're an American uh, viewer, for example, although I believe Enid Blyton sold a lot of books in America as well. Um, G.K. Chesterton was a fan, uh, for example. Um, so I think she did have quite a lot of sales uh, in America too. But uh, she's primarily a, a British uh, author, a children's author. And um, I'll just read you a, a few of her um uh, details and then I'll explain why it is I want to uh, talk about her today. So uh, Ina Blyton, she was born in 1897. Uh, she died in 1968. Um, she was a children's writer and um, she wrote, uh, she, she sold during her lifetime over 600 million copies of her books. Okay, so this is a very, very popular writer translated into 90 languages. Um, she is the fourth most translated author of all time. Um, and uh, according to Wikipedia, it says she she wrote on a wide range of topics, including education, natural history, fantasy, mystery, and biblical narratives. Best remembered today for her Noddy, Famous Five, and Secret Seven series. But she did write uh, many others as well. Um, uh, Blyton's work became increasingly controversial among literary critics, teachers, and parents from the 1950s onward because of the alleged unchallenging nature of her writing and the themes of her books, particularly the Noddy series. Some libraries and schools banned her works, which the BBC had refused to broadcast from the 1930s until the 1950s because they were perceived to lack literary merit. Uh, her books have been criticised as being elitist, sexist, racist, homophobic, and at odds with the more progressive environment emerging in second, in post-Second World War Britain, but they have continued nonetheless to be bestsellers until her death in 1968. Now, I had a look, and um, in fact, despite a very widespread uh, campaign by the establishment against Ina Blyton, from what I can tell from the 1930s right up until now, um, Ina Blyton has continued to be an extremely well-selling, uh, you know, best-selling author. In the 2000s, for example, she sold millions and millions of copies of her of her books. They've never been out of print. They keep on getting reprints. Um, so there's been, I mean, we talk about culture wars, and um, I'm interested in little things like this. Like, why is it that this that Ina Blyton? hated by the establishment, hated by, uh, you know, the literary, the kind of uh, literati. Um, why is it that an author like this has been, um, you know, pushed out? I, I would, just as I was having a look out, uh, a look around before I um, came on air, uh, I noticed that um, there was talk of an Enid Blyton coin, because of course, you know, she's a, a female author. She sold, you know, fourth most translated person of all time. Why? Uh, is Ina Blyton not more celebrated, for example, in Britain? And uh, apparently a year ago, the Royal Mint refused to um, uh, print, they refused to make um, an Enid Blyton coin. And and it said, um, you know, should Ina Blyton be, ban quote, banished to the past? Um, and this is a, an interesting little test case of how 
um, progress, like progressive culture works, but also how like the middle class uh, in, in many ways or the, or the, the chattering classes seem to form ideas about certain people in their minds and then do all they can to control the culture uh, and to, you know, choose who is in and, and who isn't in. You know, from a certain point of view, uh, Ina Blyton could be extremely well uh, well remembered and celebrated and put into the canon of great, great British people. You know, 600 million pe- uh, books inspired, you know, millions of kids around the world, um, you know, dedicated to education, uh, you know, forthright, uh, made it as a woman in the 1920s and the 1930s. Like, she's got a lot of things that you could spin into a nice narrative. Um, but no, for some reason, Enid Blyton uh, despised and banished. Now, one of the um, one of the things uh, that interests um, me about this is the is the extent to which this has failed. Okay, the extent to which um, uh, Blyton won't go away, so to speak, despite uh, attempts at censorship, despite being banished by the BBC, despite the Royal Mint not recognizing her. Um, you know these. These books won't go away. They still, they're still sold. Uh, they still remain in circulation in charity shops. Um, you know, millions of people still buy these books all the time. Now, one of the reasons I got a little bit interested in this is because when I was a kid, I had a bunch of Ina Blyton books. I had um, The Enchanted Wood. I had uh, The Folk and the Faraway Tree. So I like the, the Faraway Tree series. Uh, which had a set of characters called uh, Moonface and uh, Saucepan Man and so on and so forth. Um, and the kids were called, uh, like, uh, I'm trying to remember what the kids were called now, like Dick and Fanny or something like this. Um, and um, one of the reasons I got, yeah, yeah so the, the kids were um, Joe, Bessie and Fanny. Um, and then later on, I seem to remember some like little cousin arrives uh to hang out with them as well in one of the later books forget his name now um and uh you know they're they're fun books they 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 go to the woods they go up to the top of this tree and then right at the top of the tree there are different lands and so there's like a different adventure every week um and one of the reasons i got interested in this is because uh when i was uh when triple a came along i wanted to obviously put together a, a decent library uh, you know, for, for, for when she's a little bit older and, uh, you know, set about uh, uh, collecting books and collecting things um, in order for uh, this library to, to come about. And I, and I discovered that the Faraway Tree uh, books have been heavily edited and censored uh, in, their, in their modern versions to the extent where they've actually changed the names of the three main characters. So Joe, Bessie, and Fanny have become Joe, Beth, and Franny in the in the modern in the in the modern ones. And um, of course, me being me, I was like, well, I, I'm not I'm not having this. I don't want some sanitized modern version. I want to find an original copy uh, of this. And and I set about researching. You know, how can I find how can I find the original? uh the original versions i did manage to get a really nice uh really nice copy and i discovered that there's this website called the enid blyton society which is extremely dedicated and um which you know lists basically every story she ever wrote uh all the books she ever did and then they they kind of lobby to get these special editions done which are then put out you know non-corrupted versions you know uh, original versions reprinted um and uh, yeah, I discovered this kind of odd little nook of the, this is the sort of culture war you don't see happening, I, I guess. And little things like the Enid Blyton Society, you know, keeping the, the flame burning. Um, so uh, with all of that said, what I wanted to do today, um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Enid Blyton. Um, she uh, really made her name in the 19 in the 1930s um she was an incredibly hard working uh writer um i mean some people would say uh, if he is into uh what, what you might say ha- hackism because she 
she very much i mean i i think she was one of these writers she started at nine in the morning um and she just like she'd write for like four hours straight every single day something like that you know um so she churned out uh i mean a huge number of books i'm just trying to find the the total number of books that ina blyton um wrote uh she wrote um let's have a look um just have a look at her bib to total bibliography in the i mean it's just enormous uh 762 books written by ina blyton uh in uh which is i mean just just a phenomenal output i suppose very prolific um now some of these books were just the series that she had you know the noddy series had a lot of books um the uh she was also f uh famous for um there were three of those faraway tree books that i mentioned but she was famous for the the famous five and the secret seven and uh, these uh these books had lots and lots and lots of uh you know, there was lots of them in the series, um, but she she made her start writing in these um, in these magazines that came out, which had kid you know children's stories in them, anthologies and compilations of um, on children's stories, and uh, she wrote you know literally thousands of these uh, children's stories, and then they were uh, collected together in um, in uh, various different uh, collections um and i i had a number of these when i was a when i was a kid um as well as the faraway tree i had i had things like um anytime anytime tales for example um i'll just show you a picture of the one that i had when i was a kid uh so this is not actually my my personal copy but this is uh this is what i can remember so i'll just share my screen uh so this this was one of the books I had. I, they were, I had loads of these. Uh, this is just one example, and um, these were basically a bunch of these stories that she had uh, published in the twenties and the thirties, collected together um, to make one of these books. And so most of the seven hundred and sixty eight books are various compilations of these short stories that uh, that, uh, that Blyton wrote. Uh, now, my understanding is that the, uh, the Purnell Sunshine series, as it was called then, um, was actually just a um, uh, a kind of re. Um, so I, I remember there was a, a, a story that I uh, read a lot as a kid called Polly's P's and Q's. Um, so this was about a girl called Polly who who wouldn't say please and thank you, and so every time she didn't say please or thank you her mother would um, uh, sew a Q or sew a P into her dress until in the, at the end of the story, she is covered in P's and Q's. And obviously the moral of the story is say please and thank you. Okay. Now that, but now that story was originally uh, published in something called the second holiday book. Okay. Um, but then later on it was republished in good night stories, which is another one of these Purnell classics. And then later in the 90s, it was republished again in The Cat with the Feathery Tail. And then recently, a book came out called uh, Stories of Rotten Rascals. Um, so these are all just different publishers who picked up the rights. Um, and they keep on bringing out new compilations and new kind of remixes of all of these thousands of stories. So you can see how, uh, you know, you can get up to 768. There might be quite a bit of re repeated material uh, in, in all of those books. Um, but uh, what I thought would be interesting today would be just to have a look, just have a little read through a, a couple of uh, a couple of these stories together um, and have a think about what, why is it that the progressive establishment wants to, you know, ostensibly it's about, uh, you know, alleged sexism and racism and so on. And I mean, there's the occasional there's the occasional thing that you might, you know, like, um things that were, that were just in the culture like the, the the gollywog for example you can see why that might be a bit insensitive uh, these days um but i'm actually much more interested in the in some of the other possible reasons like what is what is replay like if you went on amazon and you kind of typed in uh the sorts of things that kids are meant to be reading now 
uh, what is it that comes up? And it's a bunch of like David Williams books and, you know, Gruffalo and all this sort of stuff. And you think, well, why is it that they want to replace Ina Blyton with David Williams in the, in the culture? Like what is, what's going on in those books as opposed to the, the Blyton ones? Uh, and I would say that the, uh, the chief differentiator is not actually these, um, you know, few passages and you can easily, you know, they, you can easily amend them to take those things out and it doesn't really doesn't really change the, the content too much uh, to be to be honest having compared what they've done because i actually went through and had a look like what exactly have they changed it's not that it's not that you know not too different what's really changed i think is the is this is the moral sense um and i find it interesting that um the progressive establishment should be so against somebody who just stands for old-fashioned almost almost victorian uh values so uh i want to have a look at uh some of those tales together and uh i've actually um found a copy of any time tales so i think we'll just have a look at the the stories in any time tales to 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 have a look at the um to, to have a look at them together now it, it's not the only reason though that she was um lambasted she was actually um uh criticized for her writing style that um she uh you know his his style was too simple or, or it was too not you know basically um not up to the standard that they wanted for uh kids in the in the 50s this was the thing that was um uh touted now just after uh triple a was born when she was very very little i had a little go at reading um just just reading some of the faraway tree that i that i bought just to try to uh you know help it sleep and so on not that she was would have understood anything at like one month old and um uh the thing that struck me about the writing is that it is kind of quite repetitive and it's quite action driven. There's always like something happening and it's a little bit frenetic in that way. But then I was thinking, well, if you're a child, if you're like, you know, five, six, seven years old, that is kind of what children are like when they write. So I, I actually think that there's something that, um, blight, some, something childlike that Blyton's writing uh, taps into. And it's probably the reason why, despite the establishment being against her for as long as uh, as it was that she um uh that she continued to sell you know 600 million books that's not not a figure to be sniffed at it's probably the reason why um they've endured because something about these stories are written in a way that connects with uh children's imagination uh, i'll just put it that way um uh, incidentally uh, if you wanted to know who the other three um more who were the more translated authors only three in uh, in the world. Uh, William Shakespeare is one, of course. Uh, Jules Verne is is the second uh, one, and Agatha Christie is the third one. So those are the only three writers who are more translated than uh, than Blyton, believe it or not. Um, so, uh, so so there we go. And j just to give you an just to give you an idea, um, uh, in the UK between two thousand and two thousand and ten, she was still a top 10 best-selling author list um, for, for the decade, um, selling uh, 30 million uh, pounds worth of books, over 8 million copies, which made which put her in the top 10 list for the decade. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea that people are still, um, people were still buying those books uh, last decade. I haven't seen the, I haven't seen, you know, the 2000 to 2020 um uh, list, but I just find that interesting that um, you know where, where where there's considerable um, pushback against these. It's like people in their reveal preferences just don't care. They continue to buy uh, these books. Um, just before we uh, I start reading these stories, I wanted to have a little um, a little look at um, uh, Blyton to give you an idea of what the woman was like. Um, cause I, I'm I'm interested by these. I guess low key reactionary figures. I mean, I don't think she was like an active reactionary or anything, but she is um, definitely, I think, a, 
perceived as a quote unquote regressive force in the culture that um you know that the 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 establishment's always got their sniffers out for kind of things like this and they feel like they want to stamp it out and i want to i want to do the opposite and kind of i'm interested to know why i'm interested to know what is it about these stories um that does this but let's take a look at uh, at the woman herself um there's a bit of a interview here i'm gonna have to be careful because parthe are pretty hot on the old um copyright but let's just play a little bit of it down at beaconsfield live two small girls that other children may well envy Gillian and Imogen don't have to wait for the next Enid Blyton book to appear in the shops. They can read it as it comes off the typewriter. So there she is, look. Uh... For their mother, Mrs. Daryl Waters, is Enid Blyton. Every day when she's working on a book, she rattles out about 6,000 words. So see, 6,000 words a day is pretty, I mean, you know, that's, that's prolific. Uh, you know, I, I thought, I mean, I can write quite a bit, but 6,000 words a day, that's, that's some pretty... Uh, Pretty phenomenal output on a typewriter. In addition, there are always proofs to be read and letters from young fans to be attended to. It's a full-time job being as successful as she is, what with stories, articles and books. Sometimes Gillian and Imogen have to insist that she must relax and play a game with them so that she doesn't overwork. Yeah, I was interested, like, uh, reading about some of the um, some of the other bits of her life. Apparently, um, her uh, her daughters complained that she didn't spend enough time with them and stuff like that. Uh, that she was actually a bit of a cold mother. But uh, yes, that's by the by. Father, a distinguished surgeon at one of London's big hospitals, joins in too. But they have to be quick to say snap before mother. So there so we go. They had a game of snap together. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's have a little look uh, then um, at uh, at. Um, the uh stories then I, i'm gonna have a look at uh the if anybody's interested um i'll just uh i'll just i won't share my screen actually um it's the anytime tales that these are this is what i'm uh, reading from and um i could i could share my screen uh we could have a little look at some of these uh stories together um so Let's have a look. It's jigsaw. I won't read read it word for word, but uh, let's going to share my screen, get it up. Uh, is that going to work? Can you guys see that? Hopefully, you can see this. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is Jigsaw Joan. You ought to be called Jigsaw Joan, said George scornfully when Joan began to do yet another jigsaw. Well, if I like doing jigsaws, why shouldn't I do them? Said Joan. You like collecting stamps, and Ronnie likes making things with his Meccano. I don't laugh at you for doing those things whenever you can. But you always take up all the table with your silly jigsaws, said Ronnie. You go on and on. I can't think uh, what you can see in them. And I can't see what George sees in his silly stamps, or you see in your endless Meccano, said Joan, beginning to be cross. Can't you see that some people like doing one thing and some another? I'm good at doing jigsaws. You're good at doing something else. I don't see why we can't all be happy doing it. Uh, why we can't, all can't be happy in our own way. Well, collecting stamps teaches you geography, so it's of some use. And making things with Meccano teaches you to be clever with your hands, said Ronnie. Doing jigsaw simply doesn't teach you anything. I'll do them just for pleasure then, said Joan, emptying out a box of coloured jigsaw pieces. And you never know, you might be glad someday that I'm so clever at fitting jigsaw pieces together. Now, now notice here that um, uh, it's interesting, thinking of the morality of the thing. Uh, Joan just wants to do the jigsaw for her, f for her own fun, whereas Ronnie is putting a, a utilitarian argument forward here for his stamp collecting um, and for the Meccano. Uh, he's, he's trying to claim that there's a, there's a use to these things. Um, whereas Joan is like, you know, well, so what? I like doing jigsaws. We shan't jigsaw Joan, said George. And remember this, when our birthday comes next week, don't give us jigsaws. We don't like them. I'm not going to, said Joan. 
I've got your presents already. George's birthday and Ronnie's came very near together, only two days between them. So they always shared it and made one big day of it between them. Joan didn't give them jigsaws, of course. She gave George a new stamp album and Ronnie a book, showing him all the kinds of different things he could build. So that's very thoughtful of Joan. You know, if Joan was a bit selfish, she'd have just bought them jigsaws, but she didn't. She thought it was like, well, George likes stamps. I'll get him a stamp album. Ronnie likes <laughs> Ronnie likes uh, Meccano, so I'll get him a book. Um, they were both very pleased. We've been lucky, they said. We've had ships, trains, books, and a 10-shilling note between us. Five shillings each, said George. Lovely, we're rich. Put the note in your money box, said their mother, but they forgot and left it on the windowsill. And the wind came and blew it away. It blew it inside the room and over to the toy cupboard. It blew right inside at the very, very back. So, of course, when the two boys looked for it, it was gone. They couldn't find it anywhere. They didn't think of looking at the back of the toy cupboard. They were very sad, but it could not be helped. The ten shilling note was gone. Now, the... Um, sorry. Uh, uh, now, a little mouse ran in and out of the toy cupboard each night. Uh, it came the night the paper money had blown to the back of the toy cupboard. It was very pleased to find it there uh, because it meant to make a paper nest. Um, <laughs> this paper would do nicely. It could bite it up into little pieces and make a cosy little nest uh, in the little toy motor car. So it chewed up the note into about 70 pieces and made a nest of it. Before any babies came into the nest, the children's mother turned out the toy cupboard and found the mouse's nest in the toy motor car. She called the children, Joan, George, Ronnie, do come and see. A little mouse has made a nest in your toy motor car. Uh, they came to look. Uh, George gave a cry. Mother, look what the nest is made of. Our 10 shilling note all bitten into tiny pieces. It's wasted, said Ronnie. We can't spend it now. Oh, what a pity. Joan emptied the tiny little bits carefully into a little tray. She looked at them. I can see what's coming here. I'm telling you, I can see what's coming. <laughs> it's rather like a little paper jigsaw, she said. If only I could fit uh, together all the little bits um, uh, properly and put some sticky uh, paper behind, the 10 shilling note would be the whole again and you might be allowed to spend it. Oh, Joan, could you do it? said George and Ronnie. Begin now quickly. So Joan's deft fingers s sorted out the tiny paper bits. She borrowed a new 10 shilling note from her mother to see how it looked. And then she began to do a peculiar jigsaw. Bits here, a bit there. That uh, fits there, uh, surely. And one should go there. Straight bits, and there's another. It's coming, it's coming, cried George. And so it was. It took Joan nearly the whole day to fit the many little pieces together and to stick them carefully at the back so that the note showed up whole. You're very patient and deaf and very clever, Jigsaw Joan, said Mother admiringly. But I don't think anyone would take uh, the note. We'd better go and ask the man at the bank what he thinks. Well, the man at the bank was very surprised to see such a peculiar note. But he said, yes, it's quite all right. He would give each of the boys five shillings for it. What do you think of that? Well, we'll never tease you, uh, Joan, uh, never, said George. You're the cleverest sister in the whole world. Come and spend our money with us. They spent it and the two shillings uh, uh, and the sixpence were spent on. Well, I'll give you a guess. You're right. A new jigsaw for Joan. She's going to do it tonight. Clever jigsaw Joan, blah, blah, blah. So you can see uh, here that uh, jigsaw Joan was being picked on by her two brothers. And uh, the moral of the story is don't count out. You never know when uh, things will come in handy. Uh, so so let people uh, get on with their jigsaws. But pretty nice little tale. Nothing too, nothing too bad about this. Um, now, there's a couple of uh, stories. Uh, there's a few other stories here I remember uh, reading when I was a kid. Uh, let me see. Oh, it, it carries on. Hold on a minute. Uh, they're both pleased. Oh, it carries on. Um, uh, what, what, what happens? Uh, they were both very pleased. We've been lucky, they said. Oh, no, no, no. It's the same. Sorry. Yeah, it's the same story. Uh, um, yeah, so there's a couple of other ones um, here. Uh, that I remember. There was Michael's new belt. I, I, won't, I won't linger on that one. Um, Little Queenie. Uh, yeah. Uh, the House in the Fog. You can see. Uh, interesting looking story. 
But um, I won't linger on this one. You know, this is one I remember in particular, Interfering Ina. This is one um, that has stuck with me because uh, when, whenever people interfere in my affairs, I call them interfering Ina. So uh, clearly this is, this is, um, this is stuck with me, this one. So maybe I'll read this one and see what you make of it. I wonder if you ever knew interfering Ina. She was a little girl about eight years old, quite pretty, quite clever, but oh dear, how did she interfere with all the other children? If she taught two or three of them playing a game together, she would go and poke her nose into the game and say, oh, you're not playing that quite right. Look, you should play it this way. And then she would make the children play quite a different way, a way they didn't want to play at all. Don't interfere, they would say at last. Go away, Ina. Well, I wanted to uh, put you right, Ina would say, and then off she would go in a huff. If she saw a little girl sewing, she would go at once to see what she was doing. Then she would say, oh, you're making an overall for your doll. I see. Well, you're doing it wrong. You should sew it like this. And then she would take the sewing from the little girl's hand and make her sew it quite differently. It was so tiresome of Ina. The other children got very tired of her. Here comes interfering Ina, they would say, as soon as they saw her coming. Hello, Ina. You're going to poke your nose into our games again? Well, go away. But do you suppose that cured Ina of her tiresome ways? Note that the uh, <laughs> note that the subject of the bullying never actually learns from their mistakes. Um, not a bit. She simply loved to interfere with everything, and she was so curious about everybody uh, and what they were doing that she was forever poking her nose here, there, and everywhere. Now, one day she was walking home alone from school. The other children wouldn't walk with her because she had interfered in a fine new game they had made up that morning and had spoilt it for them. So there was Ina walking home by herself, feeling very cross indeed. She came to a field and she heard somebody laughing. It was a funny, high little laugh and Ina stopped to see who it could be. She climbed up on the gate and peered into the field and there she saw a most surprising sight. She saw four little brownie men playing leapfrog. They were having a fine game and were shouting and laughing uh, in little bird-like voices. Ina watched them for a while and then she called them. You know, that's not the right way to play re leapfrog. You want to bend down with your back to the others, not with the front. Look, I'll show you. You know, uh, she reminds me a little bit of the Harry Enfield character, Only Me. You know, Only Me? Don't want to do it like that. Uh, Ina is very much <laughs> uh, an, an Only Me character, maybe. Maybe Harry Enfield got the inspiration from this story. Who knows? Um, she said uh, she climbed over the gate and jumped down into the field. Uh, she ran to the surprise brownies. She took hold of one of them and bent him down. He stood up angrily. How dare you push me about, he cried. A voice like a thrush's clear and high. Go away. You're interfering, little girl. Um, but I'm only trying to show you how to play leapfrog properly, said Ina crossly bend down. She tried to bend the brownie over again, but he pushed her away and then slapped her fingers. We play leapfrog in the brownie way, not your way, he said. Brothers, who is this bad-mannered child? One of the brownies looked closely at Ina. Then he laughed. I've heard of her, he said. It's interfering Ina. She pokes his silly little nose into everything and makes herself such a nuisance. Oh, she does, does she? said the first brownie, glaring at Ina. Well, every time she interferes in the future and pokes her nose into other people's business, her nose will get longer. Ha ha, that will be funny. He jumped high into the air, turned head over heels and sprang right over the hedge. The other followed and Ina was left alone in the field, a, fright, a little frightened and very cross. She went home, silly little fellow, she said, f feeling her pretty little nose as if anything would, uh, they said would come true. She had her dinner and then went out to play in the garden. She heard the little uh, boy next door talking to his rabbit as he cleaned out his hutch. Ina stood on a box and looked over the wall. Jimmy, she said, you shouldn't clean out the hutch in that way. You should have the clean hay ready before you take out the old hay. You should. 
Jimmy stared up at her and he stared again. Something funny had happened to Ina's nice little nose. It had grown quite an inch longer. What have you done to your nose, Ina? asked Jimmy in surprise. It does look funny. Ina felt her nose in alarm. Gracious, it did feel long. She rushed indoors and at it looked at herself in the glass. Yes, it had grown an inch longer. And her face looked queer with such a long nose. And Ina was ashamed and frightened. I shall have to say I bumped it and it swelled. And the little girl, uh, said the little girl to herself, she did not usually tell stories. She felt too ashamed to say that it had grown long because she had interfered. So note here that she's coming to learn the error of her ways and she's feeling shame. And the story is happy with this. Ina, sh according to Ina Blyton, Ina should feel ashamed of her behavior because it's bad manners to stick your nose into other people's business. So, I mean, it, the message, the morals are coming through pretty bluntly. Um, so when she went to school that afternoon and the other children asked her what had happened to her uh, nose, she told them a story. I bumped it and it swelled. She said, funny sort of swelling, said Joan. It isn't really big. It's just long. Ina forgot about her nose after a little bit and came in for a handwork lesson, uh, which she loved. The children were making toys. Ina looked at the little boy next to her. What are you making? She said, I'm making an engine. That's not the way to make an engine, said Ina scornfully. Give it to me. Look, you should put the funnel here. She pressed so hard on the funnel that it broke. Oh, you interfered, said the little boy, almost in tears. For he had been very proud of his engine. Ooh, what's happened to your nose, Ina? What indeed? It had grown quite two inches longer in that moment. Now it looked horrid. Ina was quite ugly. The children shouted with laughter. Ina's nose is getting longer and longer so that she can poke it into other people's business very easily, said Joan. Wonder if that's Jigsaw, Joan. <laughs> well, before the day was ended, Ina's nose was six inches long. Imagine it. It stuck out from her face and made her look very strange indeed. Her mother was simply horrified when she saw it. Ina, what have you done with your nose? Nothing, said Ina sul sulkily. It was no use saying that she had bumped it because mummy was simply wouldn't believe her. But something happened to it, something horrid, said her mother. I must take you to the doctor. So Ina went to the doctor and first he laughed when he saw her nose and then he looked grave. Last of all, he looked puzzled. I've never seen such a nose, he said. How did she get it? Uh, she won't tell me, said Ina's mother. Then Ina began to cry and she told uh, all that had happened and how she'd interfered with the brownies and they said her nose would grow bigger every time she stuck it into somebody else's business. Dear me, said the doctor in surprise. So uh, that's what's happened. Well, I'm afraid you can't do anything about it. But can't you tell us how to cure her nose? Asked Ina's mother, beginning to cry too. She was such a pretty girl and now she is so ugly. Well, I can only say that perhaps if she stops interfering with other people, her nose may go back to its right size, said the doctor, and that uh, put that uh, rests with Ina herself, poor child. Well, they went home with the mother, very sad and upset. So was poor Ina. Now, listen, Ina, said her mother, we can't have your nose growing any longer, can we? Well, you must stop poking it into things that don't concern you. You mustn't interfere anymore. You had better ask the children to help you. All right, mummy, I will, said Ina. And she went out to find her friends. She told them what the doctor had said. So please, will you help me? She begged. If I come and interfere, stop me at once. Because if you don't, my nose will grow down to my toes. And maybe I'll have to tie a knot in it to stop myself tripping over it. We'll help you, Ina, said the children kindly. Children are always kind when they see someone in trouble. And these children couldn't bear to see Ina crying tears all down her uh, uh, long nose. They had often been cross with her, but now they only wanted to help her. So the next few days, you should have seen what happened. Every time Ina came to interfere or poke her nose into something that was nothing to do with her, they spoke at once. Ina, remember, don't interfere. Then Ina would go and re read and say, sorry, I forgot. In a week's time, her nose was almost at the right size again. And soon it would be the same pretty little nose that it's been before. But goodness knows how long the magic will last. She will have to be careful all her life not to interfere, just in case her nose shoots out again. 
poor Ina. She still looks a bit queer, but I hope the next time I see her, she will not. Uh, she will look her pretty old little self. So, one of the things that interests me here is that um, if the uh, you know the social justice crowd were, were taught this story, don't stick your nose into other people's affairs. You know, if if every time some little busybody comes along and tries to uh, you know don't don't and i think this is i think this story encapsulates why people don't like sjw's you know just stay out of my business stay out of other people's affairs so next time uh, some little busybody comes along like that maybe you could just say well stop into stop interfering don't, don't be an interfering ina so that's one uh, nice little story but it's a it's the example of the sort of thing that maybe I mean I, I can't imagine the David Wellingham stories are um, are teaching. I mean this is a very specific thing interfering, but you know it's bad manners to stick your nose into other people's affairs. Um, simply not taught anymore. Uh, I think I'll just look at one more story. Um, Cross Aunt Abatha. What about this one? A spell for a lazy boy. I, th I think this uh, this this looks like one I'll have a look at. Okay, last one. And then we'll get out of here. A spell for a lazy boy. Leslie was one of those boys who was always late for breakfast, late for school, late out at playtime and behind in all their work. He was lazy and slow. And he just wouldn't be quick. Now, one day his father called him uh, to him and spoke kindly but sternly to him. This is an example, I would say, of uh, Ina Blyton's writing not being, if I was to, like, there's three hymns in that sentence. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she, she might have taken a bit more care with that, with that sentence there. Uh, when I do my new writing course, I will tell you all about, uh, you know, avoiding bits of sloppy writing like that. But anyway, um, Leslie, listen, uh, listen, Leslie, I'm going to give you a reward if you try to alter yourself. You will be one of the useless people in the world when you grow up if you don't stir yourself up a bit and really try not to be late or slow in everything. If for a whole week you are in time for everything and even first at some things and make a few uh, runs at cricket, then I will give you a new bicycle. So let's just look at the advice this father is giving to the lazy boy here. If you don't try to alter yourself, you will be one of the useless people in the world when you grow up. If you don't stir yourself up a bit, really try not to be late and slow and everything. So what is interesting about this is the recognition that this is, um, this is not just a, a, you know, this is not just a behavioral trait when you're young. If you don't form a good habit, this is a bit of Aristotelian ethics here. This father's like, if you don't form a good habit now, you're going to grow up to be a bit useless. Um, now, again, I can imagine in the modern sensibility that that sort of sentiment not being uh, not being the sort of thing that you're encouraged to tell children. But is he, is the father right? Is the father not correct that if this if this kid doesn't stop being such a such a layabout, he's going to grow up to be useless? I think it probably is. I think there's probably some truth to it. So why why would you try to cushion? young Leslie from such a truth? Question to be asked. Uh, oh, said Leslie, his eyes opening wide. All his friends had bicycles, but his father had never given him one because Leslie never seemed to try hard at anything and didn't really deserve one. So there's the question of, does Leslie deserve a bicycle? Now, again, in the modern sensibility, I think people would think, well, come on, he's just a kid, give him a bicycle. But the father's like, does he deserve, does he deserve, what's he done to deserve a bicycle when he's such a badly behaved kid? So now you're going to try hard. Are you going to try hard? Said, said his father. Leslie nodded and his eyes shone. A new bicycle, one with a loud bell and a pump. My word, how fast he would go and what fun he would have with all the other boys. But although he had such a lovely reward offered to him, Leslie didn't feel at all sure that he would be able uh, to be first in anything or even quick. He sat and thought about it. If I could get a spell to help me, it would make things much easier, he said to himself. I'll go to the old woman who lives in the heart of the wood. 
People say that her grandmother was a witch, so maybe she knows a few spells. Well, the old woman did. She gave Leslie a queer little yellow pill in a box. That's the finest spell I know of for laziness, she said. It gets you into your arms and legs almost at once and makes them quick and strong and active. You'll be all right if you take that. But mind, if you get that bicycle because of my spell, I shall expect you to ride my errands on it twice a week. Little sting in the tail from the old woman there. Oh, I will, I will, promised Leslie, and ran off with a little yellow pill. He took it before he went to bed that night. He fell asleep at once. The spell worked away inside him all the night. I got into his arms and legs and into his fingers and toes. It awoke him in the morning. Leslie began to yawn and stretch himself as he always did, but his legs gave him no time to do that. They leapt out of the bed at once. Leslie got a great surprise, but he soon had an even greater one. His arms began to work at top speed, and he found himself putting on pants and shirt and jersey and shorts faster than he'd ever done before. Goodness, said Leslie, trying to stop his hands from putting on two shoes at once, but the spell was too strong. He couldn't stop himself at all. On went his shoes and the laces were tied up in a twinkling. Then his legs took charge of him again and raced down the stairs at top speed. He fell over the cat and bumped his head. He made such a noise that his father was cross. Leslie, is there any need to upset the whole household like this? What are you doing? Leslie's legs had rushed him to the breakfast table. You see, in the modern sensibility, in the in the kind of milk sop, 2020 lens, they think, well, what's the real cause of, Le of, of Leslie's bad behavior? Maybe because it's his father's too strict. Maybe because his father's, you know, doesn't give positive reinforcement. That would be the kind of psychologizing, you know, psycho, you know, the, the modern therapy way of looking at things. Um, Whereas I would, uh, I would just put it down to uh, the fact that uh, you know, Leslie, Leslie's lazy. Basically, it's, it's not, it's not his father's fault. He needs to, he needs to get a grip. Come on, Leslie. Anyway, Leslie's legs had rushed him to the breakfast table, and now his hands were helping him to his breakfast, shaking cereal out of a packet, emptying milk and sugar onto his plate, and then making him eat so quickly that he almost choked. Up and down to his mouth went the spoon. And poor Leslie had no time to swallow one mouthful before the next was at his lips. Leslie, don't gobble like that, said his mother. Why are you in such a hurry? Yesterday you were so lazy and it took you hours over your meal. And today you gobble so fast that you choke. Behave yourself. So <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> the same with his boiled egg. His hand hacked off the table and then the spoon dived in and out. And his other hand took bread and butter to his mouth at top speed so that the egg and the bread were finished in about half a minute. Leslie, said his father, laying on the paper. Leslie, if you think this strange behavior will make me give you a bicycle, you're quite mistaken. You're being very silly. Sit back and be quiet whilst we finish our meal. I am ashamed of you. But Leslie could not sit back and be quiet whilst his spell was in him. His legs jumped up and ran him to the school satchel. His hands piled all his books in. They snapped his cap and coat and put it on. Then his legs rushed him to his father and mother to say goodbye. And then he tore out of the house down the road. He felt rather sick. It wasn't all good for him to gobble his breakfast like that. What's come over, Leslie? said mother in alarm. You shouldn't have pronounced him, uh, promised him a bicycle, Daddy, if it makes him behave like this. School was dreadful for bored Leslie that morning. He was the first there, of course. The others didn't come for half an hour. But Leslie's legs would not be... Uh, would not be going to be lazy and um, uh, neither were his hands they were soon hard at work pulling up weeds in the school garden piling them into the barrow and running the barrow at top speed into the rubbish heap the headmaster was most amazed when he arrived at the school uh, to see what was happening could this be lazy leslie could this be the slowest boy in the school we weeding at top speed and weeding the heavy barrow to the rubbish heap look at the headmaster here have a look at uh, have a look at the headmaster with his glasses and wearing the uh, wearing the mortarboard. It was too it was too good to be true. Leslie felt very tired when the school began. He wasn't used to such hurrying and such hard work. He sank down into his seat thankfully. At any rate, he would get a rest now. But no, 
No, he didn't. His hands set to work at his sums, and he copied them down at such speed that Leslie could hardly see the figures. And then the spell began to work inside his head and made his br- um, and uh, and his brain made him do his sums. He couldn't think of anything else but sums. Usually he looked out the window or round at the other boys, lazing away his time. He couldn't do that this morning. You've done enough sums now, Leslie, said the master in surprise. You've done very well. I'm pleased with you. That made Leslie glad. He was very, he was feeling very alarmed now. The spell was much too powerful for him. He didn't like doing everything at such a pace, but it was just the same in um, uh, writing lessons. The boys were told to copy out a page in the history book in their best writing. Um, at once, Leslie's fingers got to work and they wrote page after page. The master stared in astonishment. Leslie usually wrote down half a page. But here he was turning over page after page, filling it in with writing. Whatever could have happened? When playtime came, Leslie's legs shot him off to the cloakroom to get his lunch and then shot him out to the playground, almost knocking over one of the uh, two boys. What's the hurry now? What's the hurry? They shouted and gave him a push. Stop rushing like this, Leslie. It's not funny. The boys played games in the playground and Leslie ran about fast and dodged here and there caught all the others easily and knocked uh, quite a lot over the others didn't uh, the other boys didn't understand what was happening and they were cross peter gave leslie a slap and at once leslie's fists doubled themselves up and began to hit peter a fight a fight cried the boys uh, and came round leslie didn't want to fight he liked peter but his fists wouldn't stop lashing out at him then the master came up and spoke sternly and sent leslie indoors leslie sat down breathless He was tired and frightened. He wished he had never asked the old woman for a spell. School went on for the rest of the morning, and in geography, Leslie drew six different maps, much to the astonishment of the teacher. He also learned three pages of poetry, three times as many as the other boy. Uh, He simply couldn't stop himself from working at top speed. His legs raced home for dinner, and his hands made him gobble up again, and his mother was alarmed. Leslie, she said, what happened to you? Tell me, dear. It's almost as if you're under a spell. Oh, mother, I am, said poor Leslie. I asked the old woman in the wood for a spell to make me quick instead of lazy and slow, and she gave me one because I did so badly I wanted to earn that bicycle. But the spell's too strong. Whatever am I to do? I'll take you to the old woman at once, said his mother. If she doesn't take away the spell, uh, uh, you'll be tired out. Come along. So they went to the wood. His mother, who had uh, run all the way because Leslie's legs didn't seem to work, uh, the old woman laughed when she saw what the spell had been doing to Leslie. So, uh, okay, I'm sorry, she said. It only worked. Be- it only worked like that on a really lazy boy, one who had never in his life tried to be quick or punctual or hardworking. I didn't think Leslie was as bad as that. Please take the spell away, begged poor Leslie. But the old woman couldn't try. Uh, but the old woman couldn't. You'll have to put up with it for a day or two, she said. But if after that. Um, you yourself try to be quick and early uh, and work hard the spell will gradually die away but if you get lazy again i'm afraid it will come back and you'll do everything at top speed and annoy everyone and get very tired so leslie put up with it for two more days and the spell seemed to die away leslie tried to be hard uh, uh, and early for everything and work hard after that and he found it wasn't so difficult as it seemed but dear me he had only to get lazy for a few minutes to start up at top speed once more You'll be glad to know that he got his bicycle. Are you a lazy child? Tell your mother to let me know, and I'll see if I can get a top speed spell for you and cure you too. So there we go. Uh, that's a spell for a lazy boy. Um, so you can see, I mean, there's the, it's a very similar idea to the interfering Ina, where there's this corrective that comes along, uh, which is a kind of a punishment. And it's like, well... You know, if you slack off a bit, bit you're gonna, the spell's going to come back. Um, and this is very much part of the, uh, the kind of the morality of Blighton. So I'll just uh, uh, come out of here and um, we will uh, come back, see what people have been saying in chat, and then we'll get out of here, I think. Um, so uh, th- there we go. Um, somebody's saying this is basically Clockwork Orange. <laughs> Uh, uh years is saying what's the moral of the story crack is good no uh, the moral of the the moral of the story is you need to you need to be um 
you basically need to kick up the backside, and this spell was is is the is the kick up the backside basically. Um, uh, so th there's that. Uh, shall I do one more? If you want one more story, I will uh, press one in the chat. See what people say. One more story. See what people say in the chat. Press one or press two if you just want me to bug bugger off. <laughs> Somebody's saying, "My God, this is setting up the kid for perpetual anxiety." I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't stop being lazy, for God's sake. All right, they do. They want. They do want one more story. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, okay, we'll do what we'll do. One more. Uh, so just have a have a look through. Uh, um, I'm just having a look through to see what looks interesting. Um, yeah, but anyway, I mean, people are debating the the moral of the the moral of the story, and um, uh, people say, well, Edith Blyton was quite unpleasant in real life. You see, the thing is that all these stories about Edith Blyton being unpleasant and so on. Um, how much of that is the anti is the establishment propaganda in, in ensuring that you know bad things about her? Um, uh, people were, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> so um, yeah. I mean, I I I think you see. Look at the look at the state of this though. Okay, this is all of the people in the chat are, are presumably you know on on the on the quote unquote right, and yet a story like the spell for a lazy boy seems to have triggered even you. And this is an example of how I think um, quote unquote Cthulhu swims left, right? It's like, well, all of you are coming up with these kind of prog basically progressive, modern, namby pamby objections to what is in effect a very simple morality tale. Don't be lazy or you'll get a kick up the arse and, um, you know, we'll send you to the old witch and she'll give you the spell so that you're basically on tender hooks for the rest of your life. Or, and, uh, and just like Ina, you know, <laughs> Don't interfere, otherwise your nose will grow forever. You know. So, um, yeah, let's uh, let's have a look at one more uh, one more story, uh, and then I, I I've noticed and there are some super chats too. I'll do those after I finish the next story. So, um, fact, we'll do it by vote, shall we? Okay, I'll uh, I'll share my screen again, and then we'll. I'll give options and people can vote and I'll go with the I'll go with the I'll go with the majority okay so th there's the surprising broom that's option number one okay surprising broom uh there's the old red cushion that's option number two keep into the magic mirror is option number three and she stamped her foot is option number four so if you want she stamped her foot four if you want peep in the magic mirror three if you want the old red cushion that's two and if you want the surprising broom that's one so cast your votes now and i'll just kind of see what the majority is and i'll go with that let's have a look seems like people want number four Uh, quite a few twos. Uh, I think four has it, to be honest. I think it's four. So let's go for number four. So number four was... She stamped her foot. Matilda had a dreadful temper. When she was in a rage... She went red in the face, shouted, and then she stamped her foot. Matilda, please don't stamp your foot at me, said her mother crossly. No matter what you want, I shan't give it to you if you stamp like that. It's rude. Um, so, uh, again, I think the modern sensibility would say, well, probably the problem here is her mother's getting cross and Matilda's been taught to be angry, you know, by, by her mother. But... I would say, 
uh, she, I would say that the opposite. I would just say, well, Matilda needs to learn not to be, not to stamp her foot in rage. She just needs to learn, learn some boundaries, Matilda. And her mother's quite rightly cross. Matilda stamped her foot again. It wasn't a bit of good. She was just uh, sent to bed. So after that, she didn't stamp her foot at her mother anymore. Only at Jane the maid. George the gardener and her little friends. They couldn't send her to bed. They didn't like her at all when she stamped her foot at them. One afternoon, Matilda went to pick blackberries in Farmer Giles' field. She knew where there was a fine hedge of them. And as they were the last of the autumn's feast of blackberries, she went to have a very nice time. Uh, I used to go and pluck blackberries in the in the autumn. Uh, it was uh, good fun. Uh, but she found the little old lady there picking away fast and putting the big juicy blackberries into a basket. Matilda stared in rage. I came, I came to pick blackberries, she said. So did I, said the old lady, still picking. I saw them the other day, and I said to myself they should be mine, and no one else is, said Matilda, going red in the face. How funny. That's just what I said to myself, said the old dame, still picking hard. Matilda stared crossly. I want those blackberries, she said. So do I, said the old lady. You can share them, can't you? You've picked the biggest. You're greedy, said rude Matilda. What an unpleasant child you are, said the old dame, staring at Matilda out of curious green eyes. Those eyes should have warned Matilda that the old lady was magic. But people with green eyes are not the same as ordinary folk. <laughs> if you've got green eyes in the chat, let, let us know, because you're not ordinary folk. <laughs> Tell me if you've got green eyes. You're not to talk to me like that, said Matilda. And she stamped her foot. You're not to. You're not to. Don't stamp your foot at me, or you'll be sorry, said the old lady. And her eyes looked rather fierce. But Matilda didn't care. Not she. She lost her temper all in a hurry and began to shout and stamp. I want those blackberries. Stamp, stamp. I want those blackberries. Stamp, stamp. I want those blackberries. Stamp, stamp, stamp. Now look at how entitled Matilda is. And think of, think of these things not being taught and why it might have led to an, a generation of entitled children and entitled people and entitled adults, because they're not told these things, right? They're not told that this is unacceptable. Whereas Matilda or Orina Blyton is saying, this is unacceptable behavior again and again. It's all about like, what is acceptable behavior? What is good behavior? Not this. The old lady looked at Matilda in the greatest surprise. My dear little girl, she said, you shouldn't have been a child at all. You should have been a pony. Then you could do all the stamping you please. Give me those blackberries, shouted Matilda. And she stamped so heavily on the grass that she squashed it flat. I don't mind horses stamping at me, but I won't have little girls behaving like this, said the old dame. And she waved a thin brown hand at Matilda. Be a pony. Run away and stamp all you like. And then... To Matilda's enormous dis dismay, she found that she was no longer a little girl, but a small brown pony with a white star on its head. She had four legs and a long tail. She stamped with her forefoot on the grass and she opened her mouth to shout, but she neighed instead. Nay, hey, 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 nay, hey, hey, hey. Uh, well, if you want hay, Go and get it, said the old lady, going on with her picking. Matilda was frightened by her hoarse voice and ran away round the field. Oh dear, this was dreadful. She was a pony. Fancy that, a pony. She couldn't speak like a little girl. She couldn't pluck blackberries, for she had no hand. She could still stamp and she could wave a long tail about. How very, very queer. Matilda wanted to go home, so she ran to the field gate, but it was shut. Matilda stamped her foot, and the old lady laughed. Stamp away. I always love to see a horse stamping with its hoof. It's right for horses to paw the ground. Stamp all you like, little pony, and enjoy yourself. But Matilda wasn't enjoying herself one bit. Supposing the farmer came by and put her 
into the shafts of the car to carry his goods to market. Suppose he wanted to ride her. He was such a big and heavy man. And what about her food? She would have to eat grass. Matilda put her big pony head down to nibble the grass to see what it tasted like. It was horrid. She still had the tastes and feelings of a little girl, although she had the body of a pony. But whatever was she going to do? <laughs> oh, <laughs> why, oh, she had stamped at that old woman. Just like, just then, George, John, Lucy and Fred came into the field. Look, cried Fred, a new pony. Let's ride him. Matilda was full of horror. What? Let these children ride on it back? Never. She ran away to the corner of the field and the children followed. The pony stamped her foot at them and the children laughed. He's like Matilda, they cried. He stamps his foot. <laughs> he stamps his foot just like Matilda. Just then, the children's mother came along and called them. Come out of the field, children. There's no time to play before tea. Come along. Tea? Matilda felt hungry. How she wished she could ho go home and eat cakes and jam too. But what would her mother say if a pony came running into the house too? Um, uh, still, she would go home. Perhaps her mother would know, even though she was now a pony. Matilda cried a few big tears out of her large pony eyes. <laughs> She entered, she cantered out of the gate that the children had carelessly left open and went down to the lane to her. The door was open, the pony cantered inside, and there was her mother laying the tea. Good gracious, a horse coming to tea, said Matilda's mother. I never heard of such a thing. Shoo, shoo, go out at once. Matilda was right went right into the room and put her big pony head on her mother's shoulder. Tears ran down her big brown pony nose. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> something tickled me about that. Um, her big brown pony nose. Well, look at this, cried her mother in the greatest amazement. A pony crying on my shoulder. Poor creature, what's the matter? Matilda tried to get on her mother's knee, but of course, being a pony, she couldn't possibly. Now, pony, don't be silly, said her mother, pushing it away. Do you think you're a little dog or something, trying to sit on my knee? You'll be borrowing my handkerchief to wipe your eyes next. Dear, dear, I don't understand this. I must be in a dream. A voice spoke from next door. No, you're not in a dream. That is Matilda. But she stamped her foot at me, so I changed her into a pony for a time. Horses may stamp when they please but not children. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Matilda's mother, putting her arms around the pony's neck. Now I understand what this poor pony wants. Old woman, you are magic. Change my little girl into her own shape, please. I am sure she will never ever stamp your foot at you again. Uh, will you ever stamp your foot, Matilda? The old dame asked the pony. It shook its big head at once. The old woman waved her hand, and lo and behold, the pony disappeared. And there was Matilda, looking rather small and scared. Goodbye, said the old lady. Remember that only horses stamp, so be careful you don't change into one again. You never know. She went out with a basket of blackberries. Matilda looked at her mother. Don't let me stamp my foot any more, she wept, glad to find that she didn't neigh this time. Well, you must try to remember yourself, said her mother. I can't tell your feet uh, what to do. Matilda laughed through her tears. I'll try and remember, she said. I don't want to eat grass anymore. And I don't want a pony stamping about the kitchen, do you, mother? All the same. I hope if Matilda ever does stamp her foot again, it would be so surprising to see her change into a pony. <laughs> All the same. I hope I'm there if Matilda ever does stamp her foot again, because it would be so... <laughs> So, so Enid Blyton <laughs> ends the story by saying that basically, if this had happened again, she wants to be there just to see a child turn into a pony. So, um, anyway, let's think about the morality of this tale. Okay, let's 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 think about the <laughs> let's think about the um, uh, what this is. Okay, <laughs> she, um, but okay, it seems harsh, right? The old woman turned the child into a pony, 
But just think about what would happen, right, in a, in a modern story here. If that old woman turned up at the house and said, listen, I've turned your child into a pony, I think the reaction of the modern uh, of the modern um, mother would be something like, well, it, it would be to want to call the police or the social services or something. But this mother in this story basically just accepts it. She's accept, well, yeah, you were naughty, basically. Like, you shouldn't, don't stamp your feet. Um, and this, these are some of the ways in which um, these, or they'd want to sue her or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas, whereas I think um, the, the, this is one of those little ways in which you can see how the intrusion of the state, for example, into all bits of bits of people's everyday lives, kind of stops this natural i mean I, I know magic was used but basically like in real life you know she wouldn't turn into a she wouldn't turn into a pony but it would have been perfectly acceptable for an old woman like this to you know take the child back to its mother and say she was stamping her feet in a very rude way when i was trying to pick blackberries you know and and she was disciplined and she was punished and she cried don't forget she cried and was made to feel like scared by this but the moral is just well, don't do it again. So we're basically, like, kind of pushed by fear into not um, into not uh, stamping her feet. And this is the same mechanism as the interfering Ina, who is basically, uh, you know, taught a taught a lesson. Um, it's the same moral as the spell for a lazy boy. These are all like they're taught a lesson, and they're basically like no, not to do it again because the consequences are really, really severe for not following whatever the moral is okay um so th this is like basic uh basic um uh basic discipline and uh i think this is something that has really fallen out it's, it's really uh fallen out of um fallen out of the, our culture and you can see why right you can see why um the uh, the powers that be and the the kind of the the culture police, if you want, want to try to push this sort of thing into the past. So it's, so nobody's reminded, oh, things didn't used to be like this. People used to have, um, people used to have like different senses of, of morals, but think of how much better it would be if, if people, you know, were instilled with some of these, some of these values that they didn't, you know, that nowadays the only real thing that anybody is told is, well, you know, don't say offensive things, you know, all of those things matter much less you know not being it like okay it's a good thing to tell people not to be not to be racist or sexist or whatever fine but that's not all there is there has to be other there has to be other deeper character traits and character um you know aspects of you know basic morality even 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 underneath that and all of these are teaching all of these stories are teaching kids basically to be more respectful of other people. Um, they're, they're teaching people, they're teaching the kids, um, you know, th th there's a lot of, um, a lot of these things are, are kind of manners, I guess. And the manners are, well, you don't stick your nose into other people's business. Don't be lazy and don't, don't get angry and stamp your feet in public. And, and I feel like, um, you know it's not just the kids now i i feel like these things were already drifting even when i was a kid and went like like my whole generation of the you know the, the early millennials or late late gen Xers or whatever um it really these things had already started to uh to, to drift and it leads to it leads to these uh kind of negative character traits being perpetuated into adulthood and then you get very entitled generations of people even like overgrown overgrown children basically as as adults um and that that's what i think uh that's what i think all of this uh leads to so uh yes i i, I think um i think this is uh i think this is uh something worth um something worth uh remembering so um let's have a look at the uh, uh super chats I don't, I don't think there's that many but uh Worth having a look at a few of them uh, before I, I get out of here. So uh, Benjamin Shergarworth saying thanks. A, a cozy stream was much needed. Yes, uh, deepest law is all about the cozy. Um, you know, with your uh, 
flask of weak lemon drink or whatever. Um, Benjamin uh, Gabriel B said, need ASMR in the background to go with this reading. Uh, indeed, yeah, that's a very good, uh, very good suggestion. Um, Benjamin Root says, I love this. Children should be raised in an innocent pre-World War II bubble. No tech, only books for AAA. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Root also says, children need instruction and boundaries. They are like trees. You need to plant stakes to make sure they grow straight, prune branches. Uh, they need feeding well and not overwatering. Uh, Benjamin Root says, this is some damn good fathering. Sugar is crack. <laughs> uh, Benjamin, uh, sorry, uh, Benjamin Root also says, more Enid Blyton, no masks hiding, smiling faces. Jedi Knight Anakin Cringewalker says, Trump was clearly Leslie pilled. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Seems like uh, Trump had the... Uh, <laughs> the the spell for a lazy boy. Um, Spaghetto says in 2020, people would consider getting turned into a pony a good thing. <laughs> that's quite a good. <laughs> that's quite a good uh, point. And Benjamin Rood says these days parents have abdicated all responsibility to schools and the state. And I, I think um, I think that is really one of the things that comes true uh, more. Thug life bear says uh, Biden received record turnout in Wisconsin, five standard deviations above the mean. Yes, I mean, I'm not going to talk about politics today, but it's clear that there's some sh shenanigans uh, going on. Uh, I would just say uh, keep the faith, hold the line until you hear otherwise um, uh, on that. Uh, uh, Vox Day had a pretty good blog about uh, the way you should be thinking about this, unless they've declared in the, uh, you know, since I've been on this stream. Um, and um Benjamin Rue says we are weak children and that's why we are lost uh, indeed. Um, and again, that book, The Fourth Turning, goes into uh, reasons why um, uh, our generations uh, may have been more mollycoddled and less, uh, less disciplined than previous ones. So, uh, so, so there we go. All right. Uh, yeah, we are a nation of teenagers. Absolutely. I wish I was disciplined when I was younger, somebody's saying. So, so yeah, so, so this is, um, this is what I, this is why I wanted to just share a couple of Ina Blyton stories. Um, you know, it seems like a very harsh kind of disciplinarian way of, uh, of being and thinking. Um, but I actually think that, uh, I mean, look at, look at how, look at how the people of those generations turned out versus, uh, versus what you see today. So there we go. Um, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Now get out.